Have a roll call, Liz. Council Member Story here. Peterson here. Brooks here. Bador here. And Mayor Bertrand here. So stand for pledge of allegiance. Kristen, I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic. a report from closed session with respect to the two litigation items council took no reportable action with respect to the city attorney performance evaluation council directed to release the RFP and further to execute an interim city attorney contract which will be on at the following meeting okay. so we do have um, presentation from Monterey Bay community power Welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be the mayor for the uh, community. <laughs> <laughs> so, my name is Lena Williams. I'm the manager of Energy Account Services for Monterey Bay Community Power. You need, you need the microphone. Okay. There you go. <laughs> So I'll repeat just in case. So my name is Lena Williams with Monterey Bay Community Power. I'm the manager of Energy Account Services. Um, so I'm here to provide you guys with the annual report um, of what we've achieved to date as your community choice aggregator. So for anyone who is not aware, community choice um, energy aggregator actually sources a renewable and um, carbon free power sources and works in collaboration with the investor owned utility, in our case PGE, to um, provide you with your full energy services. So you receive the same um, billing and services through PGE, but now you're receiving renewable energy at, at competitive rates. So, who we are um, the city of Capitola is one of 23 cities that makes up part of our JPA, so our Joint Powers Authority. And the goals, of course, are to maximize greenhouse gas reductions, to have competitive stable rates, and of course, to provide local energy projects and programs utilizing the revenue that's <coughs> generated um, from um, our energy um, costs. So our accomplishments to date, so there's a lot of stuff on there, so I'm just gonna focus on our two most important. Um, so one, we've reinvested over one million into energy programs, and I'll give you a few details about the ones we've gotten started so far. Um, we've also put $4.4 million in rebates back into uh, the pockets of our customers. So they received those on their December bill for their 2018 usage. And then we've um, gathered or garnered about $7 million in um, electric vehicle infrastructure grants. And then we matched that with an additional million for Monterey Bay Community Power. So close to $8 million actually available for our electric vehicle infrastructure program. And then our financial stability. So we have over $58 million in revenues and we've actually repaid all of the um, debt service and loans that we used to actually um, develop our infrastructure and get started. Hmm. So our projects that are on the horizon. So in a joint partnership with, uh, with um, Silicon Valley Clean Energy, we were able to actually procure two solar plus storage projects that are gonna go online in 2021 and then one wind project out in New Mexico that also goes online in 2021. And our two PV plus storage projects actually represent the largest PV plus storage project in the entire state of California. So we're pretty proud of that. And then as I mentioned, um, the Monterey Bay Community Power Rebate. So this is an annual program. Last year it was 3% going back to customers. We anticipate that's gonna be higher going into this year. But so far, $4.4 million has gone back to customers who are enrolled with Monterey Bay Community Power. And for the city of Capitola, so 5,950 currently enrolled customers. So that's 97.4% of the Capitola population actually enrolls. 
Um, 67490 was the amount that went back to in-community savings. Those are rebates both on the residential and the commercial side for um, 2018. And the commercial actually customers receive their rebates quarterly, so that's a little bit higher on their side. And then over um, 25 enrollments that have actually moved into our other program. So Monterey Bay Prime, which is our 100% renewable, and BeShare, which allows people to choose to reinvest um, their rebate into programs for low income and fixed income families. And then Monterey Bay Green, which allows people to reinvest their rebates specifically into projects um, that support renewables on the Central Coast. Um, our energy programs, one of our primary goals, of course, is the electrification of um, vehicles, of course, because the greenhouse gases are the largest emissions um, come from our vehicles currently, so we do um, invest heavily in those programs. And then we also are looking at programs that support renewable projects um, for residential customers as well. So our first project uh, to program to come online Monterey Bay um, EVIP incentive program. So this is a joint program with MBAR that actually is allowing us to um, provide not just rebates, but certificates that are accepted same as cash by participating dealers. Um, that buy local program is May 1st through July 31st. Um, so we actually have information available on our site and I also included it in the information packets I left for you um, for um, individuals who'd like to purchase vehicles, but even beyond that, it also includes the purchase of fleet vehicles for public agencies, nonprofits, and educational institutions. So they can still apply to receive this, um, with of course the goal to incentivize those to actually put electric vehicles, more of them on the road. And then your choice. So after August 1st, instead of um, having very specific um, vehicles and dealerships participating, it actually opens up to all dealerships, um, new and used, and also includes hybrids and motorcycles for those who want a motorcycle, electric motorcycle in that program, in the program starting August 1st until all of the um, funding runs out. Smart Connect is our microgrid program. Um, so we've taken our first round of applications, those closed on the 22nd, and we're currently reviewing sites for this program, which of course is allowing for um, businesses that are having challenges as they develop and grow with getting electricity out to their site. So this allows them to have islands um, microgrids that are available and can be, of course, net metered once PG&E is actually able to build out there. Um, but the time for um, PG&E to put in electric infrastructure, the timeline is really long. So it kind of prohibits um, the growth of new business, of course, and this allows them to come online sooner. So we're hoping to have um, some of our first projects actually move into the next round with the bids out into the open market before the end of the year. And then Cal EVIP, I mentioned that earlier, and you can see the breakdown by county. So those are the funds that are actually being set aside to increase electric vehicle charging station infrastructure. Of course, right now it's really cost prohibitive with a lot of challenges, um, both for property and business owners to identify not just where to put them, but how to fund them. And so the program actually provides financial support, whether um, the located site is going to be a purchase or a lease option and then we're providing match funding to go into the project to help get it started. And then going forward, I mean, our objective is to actually continue to meet with um, our member agencies and city, city members putting together um, community surveys, putting together workshops and um, working groups with our public sector members so that we can actually identify other projects for the future. So um, that's the end of my report. And of course, I provided information for you there. I'm your direct point of contact with the city of Capitola for any additional questions that you may have. So thank you questions? for giving me your time. Questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Um, just real quick, you're, you mentioned that there was 97% enrollment um, out of an estimated 5,950 customers. Is that can you tell me a little bit more about that? Was that 5,000 previous PG&E customers that moved over? So they're actually joint customers or shared customers. So PG&E is still providing, um, you know, the power lines. If the power were to go out, PG&E is still rolling the trucks out. Your bill still looks exactly the same. But we're actually sourcing the energy from renewable and 
carbon neutral sources, so we're providing the generation portion only. So through that enrollment, what that means is that a customer receives one bill that instead of including all of PG&E's bundled services, the portion that um, out was allocated to generation previously on the PG&E side is now coming from Monterey Bay Community Power, and then the customer is still paying in total the same bill that they were paying before. So when the postcards went out to the community, only 3% opted, opted out. Correct. Is there an opportunity? Are you going to send it out again so folks can opt not opt they can yeah they can <laughs> technically they can opt out at any time it's <coughs> on our it's available to them on their website there's information actually on the pg e bill there's a separate page for monterey bay community power included in there that has the website and the phone number included for those who don't want to participate or who have questions that's great thank you mm -hmm. ed uh, i'm on a similar path okay i was, <laughs> I was highlighted by the 97 percent i'm just going to the 97.4 that you mentioned in capitola is that consistent with th throughout the other agencies that are involved? Or, or th is it so we're at 96.4% enrollment overall through um, the Tri-County. So some are, down at n some are down at 92 and some are hi as high as 98. And, and on top of that, the reason for the opting out, is there a reason given or do when they do it, do they just opt out without a reason? Or so good question. So it depends. So we have about uh, in our last kind of survey of the opt out reasons, um, we had about 19% that declined to state, but then we do have some who, for example, have an existing rate plan that we don't support, and we find that with some of our commercial customers who tend to have really high usage. Um, and then also we have some who just didn't want to participate for whatever reason. So, I mean, we don't make, it, we don't make them tell us why, but um, we do ask. And so for that, it, you know, that's what it comes down to. Rate plan, decline to state, and then the most common one when the program first launched was there were people who didn't like the automatic enrollment. They weren't sure what it was and they wanted time to investigate further and, yeah. and participate later. Something new. Well, I, I, I think it's a fabulous program and it's been <laughs> obviously by the numbers highly successful. The fact, yeah. fact that you've paid off what we've already invested and money set aside for renewables. So it's just a great program. And I guess 97% should be a number we should all be happy with. So yeah, great, great job. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the project. When you said projects, I was thinking Monterey Bay Community Power actually built something. But what you're really saying is that they contracted with an entity that is in wind, solar, and et cetera to provide. Is that correct? Correct. So that's one of the sources of future generation. So actually participating um, down the line because, of course, you're purchasing power and um, acquiring these contracts sometimes for 20 to 30 years to provide the renewables. Um, from one particular area, and so that that was what we did. So that's not that's part of our procurement side. Our projects really have more to do with what we've done to reinvest. So um, <coughs> our project Sunshine, where we completed installations or supported installations of solar on low-income family homes, that was actually in partnership with Grid Alternatives, and so we didn't build the system, we didn't install the system, but we provided match funding okay. so that that home, you know, that family didn't have to actually pay out of pocket to make that switch. Okay. And the, the ones that are listed um, on slide six, I guess, how long do those contracts go out? Uh, so it depends on who that particular, what that particular <laughs> contract states. So 20 years, 20 to 30 years. You depending. want something stable, so. Exactly, yes. So um, that we don't have to worry about fluctuations in the rates going down the line. Um, one thing you didn't talk about, I know there's an advisory committee. Could you expand on that and what they're doing? So um, depending on which committee it is, there's actually a couple. Um, depending on public sector, of course, we have a community advisory committee that's made public up sector, right. of community members. Um, and so what they'll do is, of course, we do report out on what the other projects are, but they help to support and participate and um, garner interest in our community, whether it's workshops, or surveys so that we can get direct feedback on viable programs for each area. And since they all represent different portions of the Tri-County, it allows us to get kind of broad feedback from the community. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much for Thank your you. presentation. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Okay. Um, report and closed session, please. Oh, we already did that. Excuse me. Okay, um, additional materials?
We have one item of additional material, and it's for item 10A regarding the Capitola Branch Library Project. Okay. So, any additions and deletions to the agenda? Staff has no changes. Okay. Uh, now it's time for public comment. Anyone in the audience here can make a presentation of three minutes or less on any item that's not on the agenda. Anyone would like to come forward? And yes, please do. Thank you. Uh, my name is Steve King, and I'd just like to thank you all. I'm not sure who all voted for it, but somebody here voted and said that I could put my pictures up. So Oh, those ah. are yours. So I did. Yes, they're great <laughs> pictures. They really are. Uh, yeah. So I just take a minute. People always say, well, how do you do that? So I just have a minute or so. So you have a telescope, and when you normally have your eyepiece, you take it out, and you have an adapter, and you can put on a digital camera. Mm -hmm. So then you can take a picture. But the, all of these pictures, they're all big enough. You would be able to see them with your naked eye, but they're too dim. They're very dim. And so these are all like between three and eight or nine hour exposures in order to bring it up to where you can actually see it. And those are the actual colors that are out there. They're just too dim to see. So if mm. we could actually see that, the sky would be even more beautiful than it is. But uh, so anyway, that's what they are. There's information on them if anybody wants to know. But they're all taken from right over. I live in Aunt Nelly Mobile Manor mm -hmm. and they're on Roman Street, and they're all taken from the driveway of my mobile home. Oh. That's where they're taken from. Wow. wow. Oh, that's pretty cool. So well, they look great in our chamber. Okay. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I hope you enjoy them. We do. Thank you so much. We were talking yeah. about just before the meeting started, uh, earlier on before 6 o'clock. Yeah. Well, somebody Great. said if you're looking out kind of spacey, you know, you've got a good reason for it now because. <laughs> 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 well, okay. <laughs> Sam, you, you. Yeah, Mr. King, I just, uh, these are quite impressive. Uh, but I did want to let you know that who approved these w was the Art and Cultural Commission for the City of Capitola oh, okay. at their meeting last Tuesday. Um, and so, um, you know, they, uh, the Arts Commission has control of the walls here. Um, and um, we like to, um, I think, display uh, local artists such as yourself um, and to, you know, both inform and educate the community about, you know, what's in the greater universe. So thank you so much for taking these pictures and sharing them with us. Uh, you're most welcome. It's always nice. I, I'll never break even in this hobby, uh, but, <laughs> but <laughs> it's just fun when other people enjoy and it's fun to see people enjoy it. So wonderful. Thank yeah, you very thank much. Thank you. Yep. So, any comments from the City Council? <coughs> well, oh, Sam? Maybe, yeah, I'll, I'll continue on that theme about the Arts Commission. Uh, we met last Tuesday um, uh, and uh, approved the universe being uh, brought into our chambers here. <laughs> um, uh, but um, there were a couple of other items that we discussed and, and made some um, actions uh, to move forward with. Uh, one of them, and we actually had um, Steve Jesberg, our public works director, attended the meeting, and we had some discussions with him about public art. Uh, but one uh, project in particular that I wanted to announce is uh, starting to look at uh, and preparing um, a call to artists for replacements for our trash receptacles on the Esplanade, on the beach, uh, trying to come up with something that's both uh, more attractive, maybe more informative, and motivational to encourage people to recycle when it's appropriate and also to be functional um, for uh, our public works crew um, and for the public so uh, we'll be um, um, studying that uh, particular project getting some specifications from Steve and then putting out a call of artists and we'll see what comes forth uh, and of course any final selections by the Arts Commission will be coming to the council for final approval. Um, uh, and the other item um, is uh, we set up a committee to start planning for a, a youth battle of the bands. Um, so we're very excited uh, about that project um, and going to be uh, talking to the school district uh, about location, getting their participation, um, and we're looking uh, and very uh, forward uh, to doing our very first uh, Battle of the Youth Bands. So look for that um, uh, in the future. 
Where would you have that? Um, well, we haven't decided yet, but most likely the spot would be at the New Brighton um, Auditorium. Uh, mm -hmm. It seems the most suitable site. Um, we were thinking about maybe doing it as a fundraiser for the music programs, uh, maybe at New Brighton or uh, at the uh, other schools in the SoCal Union School District. So those were just some thoughts, but uh, it hasn't been uh, finalized yet. Um, and one final point, uh, our request concerning items for the on a future agenda item, uh, I would like to ask that, um, that the staff bring to us uh, a report on um, Assembly Bill 857, which is the public bank's uh, proposal that's uh, in Sacramento right now. Um, I mean, just to educate the council and, and for um, to determine whether the council would like to uh, uh, give its um, support uh, for that assembly bill. Patricia? Thank you. Yeah, um, I just have two quick comments. One is that it is, this week is the 45th annual EMS week. And so I wanted to take uh, this opportunity to say thank you to all of our community's emergency medical service providers for all that they uh, do to keep our community safe. Um, and I also just wanted to make a general um, uh, announcement that with Memorial Day weekend coming up, I hope that we will take a moment to honor those who have sacrificed for our country, but also to remember to celebrate uh, safely and responsibly this, this coming weekend. So um, curiosity is getting to me because there are students that visit our meetings quite frequently and I would love maybe in the future not to call any of you out today unless you want to tell us why you're here but maybe at our next meeting maybe more students well, you can ask him. well does anyone want to tell us why you're here today it's it's killing me please thank you uh, we would encourage uh, your complete participation, yeah. Especially if you're going to one day aspire to be a slug. Well, now, now you know who to ask to cool. sign your certification. Yeah. Are you uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, so we're here for a public policy class at UCSC. It's taught by Don Lane and oh, Don, oh. Yes. Mayor Lane and yeah. Cynthia Smith. Or Cynthia Cynth Chase. Cynthia Chase. Yeah. Two and minutes. we have mm -hmm. to do 10 hours of uh, public meetings throughout the course of this quarter. We can do that all tonight. Shall we? Uh, <laughs> I'm okay with that. And do you I'm need not okay with that. Do you need to get something signed? At some point, but not yeah. now. Well, uh, Council Member Brooks would be happy to do I that. I would be honored as an <laughs> alum to sign off on your paper, on Thank your documents, you. yes. Any one of you planning to run for office? <laughs> oh, oh someone got his hand up, all right. Excellent. Good. Want to do your elevator speech? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> well, we had a fact meeting last night, and two students came, and uh, they were definitely involved. Um, they didn't say much, but uh, you could tell they were very interested, and that's our finance advisory committee, and we did have a lot of discussion about all sorts of options, which will be reported on later. So um, I agree with you, Sam. The, uh, the bank option, um, I, I definitely want that on a future agenda, too. So, Seth, any comments? Excuse me, Mayor. Oh. I, thought hey, that's I, fine. I, think I was just waiting for my turn. Oh, yeah. uh, real quick, just want to make an announcement that I uh, yesterday attended a uh, RTC Regional Transportation Commission uh, ribbon cutting ceremony in Santa Cruz, which was a pretty big deal. It was the first, we opened the first segment of the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail, which someday hopefully will extend through all 32 miles of Santa Cruz County. But yesterday was the opening of the first segment, which was anybody that uh, goes across the San Lorenzo River next to the boardwalk, there was a little bike path walking trail that was attached to the bridge. It used to be about three or four feet wide and it was pretty rickety and I don't think you could get two people past it simultaneously without squeezing. And that was removed and about a $2 million uh, 10 foot wide walkway has been replaced there. It has lighting, it's very stable and uh, it is now operational. It was opened uh, but it was open about a week ago, but the ribbon cutting ceremony was yesterday. And it is, like I said, the first segment of that trail. And there are two other segments that are planned and funded. So ahead, moving forward with the trail that could someday encompass the entire Santa Cruz counties. Yay for the RTC. That's it.
stuff. Okay, any more? Okay, staff? Oh, just a couple for you this evening. First, I just wanted to let the council know that uh, staff is looking, council members, if anyone is interested in volunteering to help us out review um, proposals from consultants to help us review our community grant program, to let me know offline. Um, if I end up with more than three more than two volunteers, then we'll probably agendize it for a future meeting. So if you're really interested, let me know. Um, I don't anticipate it taking too much time, but this would just be to help us pick the consultant to help us review our community oh. grant program. Uh, so you can let me know by next week. And if I do get three or more um, requests, then we'll put it on probably just a budget hearing so we can keep the process moving forward. I'll, I'll be glad to help on that. Okay. Um, yeah, real, real quick, Mr. Yes. Mayor. Sorry. I just wanted to report that uh, the lagoon grading and beach grading is was delayed. It was supposed to start this Monday. It was delayed due to the rain. We are on schedule right now. It looks like the flows are cooperating, and we will be starting that the day after Memorial Day, so on Tuesday. And uh, we will try and uh, clean up our existing beach. Uh, we're going to try and rake the kelp as best we can for the Memorial Day weekend, but. We will have a, uh, a creek through the beach for Memorial Day weekend, but it's unfortunate, but uh, we can't control the weather yet. Thank you. Well, I've, I've gone out to watch Rake the Kelp. It's, it's quite interesting what you so guys go through. Steve, you're thinking you're going to start the lagoon on the 4th of June? Is that? Uh, no, the, the day after Memorial Day, I think it's the 28th. Oh, okay. Tuesday okay. the 28th? Yeah. Got it. All and right. we hope to have it in place by the following, that next weekend. Got and it. And then we'll do additional grading the first week in June. So let's move on to item eight, boards, commissions, and committee appointments. We do have some committee appointments. And who is oh, Larry. Mr. Mayor, okay. Council members. Um, so at the last Art and Cultural Commission meeting, um, the commission recommended two um, applicants to uh, for commissioners. Um, the first one's at large, and it's Laura Aliato, who happens to be in the audience today. Um, and for the artist representative, it was uh, Kelly Mazunder. And so at this point, um, they both were recommended unanimously by, by the commission um, for, for approval. Yeah, I'm here to uh, answer any questions. Any questions? Um, well, we do have someone in the audience that is going to be, do you want to make a comment? It's, you don't have to. I read your application that came out very strongly in what you wrote. Yes. Okay. Um, so, any question? Okay, is there a motion there? I I'll motion. Move. Oh, nope. excuse me. You go ahead. <laughs> motion <laughs> to appoint Laura Alioto and Kelly Monsunder. I'll okay. second. Second? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Good. Welcome aboard. Thank you for your service. Yes. So we have a consent agenda. Um, all items on a consent agenda would be an uh, item in one vote. And um, are there any people in the audience that have any issues with the consent agenda and would like the board for further discussion? Seeing none, bring it back to the city council. Any items on the consent agenda you have a problem with? I'll move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Let's go on to general government public hearings. So we have an update on the library project. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, this is our every two month update on the library project uh, to go through what's been constructed and uh, the cost to date. Uh, so looking at the recent completions, we uh, they have completed the water main re relocation on the site. Just to refresh everybody, the existing water main that services the subdivision behind the property had actually run through the parking lot um, of the library and it needed to be relocated still within our property uh, to because the new building would have gone over the top. So they completed that work. They've completed about 70% of the retaining wall footings. Uh, these are the footings that the walls go on and they've also completed about 35% of the retaining walls on top of that. The retaining walls are, are mainly along the wharf, wall, wharf road site um, as you go in-ground, we, we are transitioning to a um, slab-on-grade building, so that's part of the earthwork that they'll be doing. <coughs> um, they also relocated the driveway along Wharf Road. If you go to the site, you see the, the old driveway is now closed, and the new driveway is uh, 
is open, although there isn't much space to drive a car on the site right now, so I wouldn't recommend going there. If you want to go on the site, walk and, and let us know. So upcoming work, uh, they're going to complete the outer retaining walls. They're going to finish construction of the bioretention swales, and they're going to complete the earthwork for the remainder of the foundation so then they can move to the uh, slab on grade foundation. Update on the cost. So the there's been no change orders issued since uh, we were last here in March. Um, the value of the contract is still eleven million five hundred eighty-eight thousand five hundred fifty-nine dollars. Um, that is still fifty-five thousand dollars short of our value engineering goals. Um, and there's a seventy-seven thousand dollar deduct change order is still in process. The reason it's being delayed is they they need to get the trust designs in to make sure we can get the window design reductions that were in there part of it. So it's just part of the process of going through this. Um, there's no issue that it's going to get approved. It's just getting the bids from the uh, subcontractors to agree. And like I said, there's no been no additive change orders uh, added at this point. <coughs> Expenses to date have been $1,384,527 and change. We're about 12% of the cost complete on it. Um, right now, there's 68 days of rain delays that have been added to the contract. So there's so many, given so many working days to complete the project, we've added 68 days to that. So the projected completion right now, if this is the construction, would be April 2020. We're looking probably at an opening of in June of 2020 at this point. And the current construct contingency balance is $753,795. So the attachment that I passed out today is kind of an updated budget analysis. It shows the different line items, the contingencies, and how much money we have. Um, I will mention on the lower right, and there's a little box that says open and pending uh, CORs, that's change order requests from the contractor, just items that they're kind of bringing to our attention. So we are looking at some additional costs. Um, a lot of it is delay delay cost and some we've run into some dirty dirt that needed to be hauled off site and things like that. Certainly not um, final in any way, uh, but those are change orders that they kind of brought to our attention as, we're, as we meet weekly uh, that are potential. So <coughs> I keep adding a picture here. So this is the first report in January when it was raining. And then in March, we came back and we were, you can see they were starting to construct footings and start construction. <coughs> and this is where we are today. You can see we have quite a bit of the retaining wall foundation up. And you can see in the back of this picture how far back the, the building's going to extend. This is the, the far corner, far north corner of the building. So this whole frontage is building. It's also quite illuminating when you realize this is going to be essentially the elevation of the first floor, of, well, it's not the one floor building, but the, of the floor of the building is going to be at the elevation of the top of this retaining wall. So it's going to be projected quite above Wharf Road here, and then it kind of blends into the site at this end. So this is kind of where I wish I could stop, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> so do we. Yeah. Um, you know, as I, we've let you guys know in the past, there is a conflict with the power lines um, on the site. The existing E's along Wharf Road extend into a six foot buffer that defines a no build zone, and that's per the public utility code. <coughs> in addition, the top of the roof and the E's encroach into a 10 foot working safety zone around the high voltage lines, and that's an OSHA requirement. And it's easiest to see it in the attachment that was included in the agenda report. So you can see this is the corner, the north end of the corner, so up by where the driveway will be. You can see these dashed or the striped area is that six foot zone. You can see we extend, the eaves extended, it's about two and a half feet right here. And it, as you get up to, this is toward uh, Clare Street, it's a little bit less. And then these circles represent the 10 foot uh, safety zone that they have to maintain. And you can see it's a pretty large conflict. So right now, the way it is, it's pretty difficult to construct uh, uh, these corners of the building. Um, so we obviously we've been working on options. There's really been three options that have been looked at at this point. One is to underground the utilities around the site. I'm going to talk about that one a little bit more in a minute. 
The other is to restructure the lines on new poles in the same location. And again, that's, that'll, more details on that to come. And the last option that was looked at was to relocate the poles across the street so that the Rispin side and move the overhead wires over there. Um, this option has been tabled for the time being. Um, it does require a significant amount of tree removal or trimming on there and as some of you may know that most of the Rispin property is covered in conservation easement and removing or trimming those trees could be probably more time consuming to get it done. It, I, I'm guessing it'd probably take us a year to get all the required approvals just to trim and remove those trees. So I've kind of taken that one off on the table. Um, cost wise, it's not, that it's not a great cost savings from undergrounding. Um, so we we've decided not to, we're not pursuing that one any further. So undergrounding all the utilities. So the kind of a benefits and status, this cleans up the entire site. It provides the cleanest final project. All the wires will be removed underground and it also improves the Rispin site. Uh, right now we have an overhead service to the Rispin that would be become an underground service, allow us to underground it all the way to the mansion. So it cleans up the library site and cleans up the Rispin site. Like I said, all wires, that includes high voltage, low voltage, AT&T cable lines would be placed underground. The design would be completed by PG&E or a consultant. Right now PG&E is indicating that they have the uh, bandwidth to complete the design in a relatively quick um, time frame. So that would most likely be our choice, but if they get delayed, we could um, have a consultant design it. The costs are probably very similar. Uh, the construction and placement of the conduits, so you trench and put the pipes underground that they eventually will pull wires. That could be done by PG&E or a contractor. Here's where we would probably save time by going with the underground contractor is on site who's a, a licensed PG&E contractor, um, but we could study that as we move forward. Um, wire pulling through the conduits, so the actual undergrounding of the utilities is done by each utility company separately. You know, these next two bullet points are, are my best estimates at this point. So it's six months to complete that, six months from the day we say this is what we want to do to um, them hopefully pulling lines and, and at this time, you know, really sketchy about this one, but that two hundred to three hundred thousand dollar estimate is, is the information I have at this point. PG&E will not give us an estimate until we pay them to do some engineering, and then they'll start providing us better information. That's kind of the, the chicken before the egg. We have to give them money before we can make a selection, but that's the where we are. So here's a picture um, showing the overhead wires. This is obviously at the corner of Wharf and Claire's. Here we have wires coming down Claire's. These wires here are the ones going to a pole over here and the service wires to Rispin Mansion. We also have wires running along uh, Wharf Road. So under the undergrounding option back at this pole, essentially there would be, it, the wires would go underground, would wrap around the entire site and to the far corner of the project on this side. It would all be undergrounded. All these wires continuing would be undergrounded down Wharf Road to the next pole, which is not in the picture, and the wires going toward the Rispin Mansion would also be undergrounded. So it would clean up uh, the site, obviously, and um, provide long-term benefits in that way, but it is expensive. Restructuring the high voltage lines is the other option we're still pursuing. So that moves all the power lines to one side of the power poles that are there. I have a picture, I'll show that in a minute. All the other utilities, the AT&T and the cable, would stay um, basically as they're configured. They do not have the separation requirements um, that the power lines do. Basically, they're low voltage lines and aren't, you can grab a hold of them and they're not going to hurt you. So there's, that's why there's no separation. New poles would be installed to replace the existing poles. Um, the stresses are on them are different and PG&E said they'd have to replace the poles. Um, this one would be, I think, only designed and constructed by PG&E. They're, pr they're proprietary on their overhead line. Um, according to PG&E, it's about the same time frame, about six months from initial start to go. And once again, 
rough estimates are 100 to 150 thousand dollars, about half the cost. And most of that is PG&E is actually saying their costs are the same. It's the additional utilities that don't have to get touched under this. For an undergrounding, AT&T has to come in, redo all their services. Same with the cable company. Um, so that's the biggest difference there. So <coughs> this is actually the next pull down beyond our property. And you can see here, this is what's called an alley arm. All power lines are off to one side of the, of the pole. And this is the option that they would reconstruct the poles um, by the library to actually extend them out this way so they'd be out over the road and farther away from the building. Um, you know, I'm not an, uh, certainly no expert on line design. I think it would take them um, redoing quite a bit of lines because they'd have to be longer than they are now and how how they exactly go about that, I don't know. But that is the, the, what we're talking about is an alley arm extending out one direction. And you can see the other utilities down lower, this is phone, AT&T and cable would remain attached to the poles. So from a discussion standpoint, um, we have begun discussions with the project consultants concerning errors and omissions, certainly we staff feels that this is something that should have been discovered during the design phases by you know whether it was the architect or the civil engineer or the electrical engineer all were working on the project is something that um, should have come and um, we've begun those discussions i really don't have an update then i know they're talking with their insurance companies and um, we'll give you an update uh, when we can on that pg e is waiting for a disc uh, for direction from the city um, I think we can start anticipating delays because they won't be able to begin construction of that front wall of the project in July and August um, if we don't make a decision. And PG&E has kind of indicated they're willing to help us come up with some workarounds, insulating the voltage lines or other issues, depowering them while they're doing work. Um, once we kind of make a commitment to them, uh, that may help alleviate any delays. Just for a, a, a delay in this project that not a result of the contract itself is something that he gets reimbursed for. So there are costs associated to the contractor if we, we or in this case, you know, something beyond their control delays the work, they, they are due compensation for those delays. So there's an additional cost. And that would be part of if we, um, as we talk about errors of mission with the architect that we would discuss with them. So my recommendations tonight are to accept the report on the construction progress. And it would be great if the council had any input they wanted to uh, give me on undergrounding versus the restructuring. And the final direction would be to direct staff to diligently pursue the final details on the options and return to the council with final consideration as soon as possible. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Excuse me, Dan. Oh, I don't, Dan, have I signed up? Nope. I thought you, okay. I do. Whoever jumps first, Sam. All right, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Steve, um, for updating us on that report. I um, wanted to start by, um, was the option also discussed about uh, modifying the eaves? And is, is that a feasible option? It is an option. Um, I'm sorry to include that. It's something that changes the looks of the building dramatically and um, it's not something we've spent a lot of time looking at. We really think the building design dedicate, you know, needs those eaves to be complete. Um, something I could pursue further if you'd like me to. Doesn't that option also leave in place that 10 foot buffer so that the front of the building couldn't wash the windows? Yeah, it, it, it doesn't resolve all of the construction issues with the 10 foot buffer. Though. Can you go back to that slide that showed that, please? Uh, pass it through to you, thanks. Yeah. So, so what what what's the, what was that about? Cleaning so, the to order if if we cut the building off here and don't have the eaves, it's still so close. I mean, there's only like a foot in here. You really couldn't get in there and work very easily. Um, so there are still some issues. Um, you could probably construct it. it. Might not be easy to construct, but there still could be maintenance issues because you, even though you're outside that ten feet, there's not really a big enough room to work in there. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, on uh, the undergrounding option and what you showed, by my count, it looked like that 
there would be maybe five um, poles that would be uh, removed. Did I'm counting in my head here. So I think it would be. So there's there's two on Claire's. Two on Claire's. And the three on Wharf. Three on Wharf and one on Rispin. And r and the one across the street on, that pole would actually come yes, down as pole, well. Yes, yeah. Okay. Um, but let me just, to do that, there is most likely be a, a new pole added right here at this pole. Um, what it is is they can't underground the service from this pole because it has a transformer on it, so they have to have a down pole, as they call it. So there'd probably be another pole added 10 feet from this pole. Same thing at this end, <coughs> and same thing with the one far, um, south on Wharf Road. So we take down five, but we still have to put three back in. Three additional poles? Yes. In the, um, okay, so we, we net gain the net gain of two, two but you two get poles. you get you know 750 feet of no p no wires above ground yeah okay um another was it discussed and I it's probably not ideal but uh, making the poles um higher so that they are above the eaves so we'll go back to this one more time so Higher would resolve the working conflict, uh, but it would not re resolve the six foot setback. That setback requirement goes from the ground up upward. So we'd still have the I issue see. with the eaves in the see. working area. Okay. Okay. Um, I r and I, I recall that pg and &E used to have a beautification program where they made conscious efforts to underground uh, poles and wiring. Um, and I think that that's a great initiative. Um, but are, do they still have any such program and, uh, and w would be uh, that they could contribute to this project? So pg e does have a undergrounding program. It's, it's called Rule 20A. And um, it is a, I'm not exactly sure how it's funded, um, but there's the city establishes and earns credits toward undergrounding projects. Unfortunately, it only can be applied in commercial area on arterial streets and high commercial areas. And you know, I've talked to PG&E, I've talked to three different people at PG&E whether we could qualify this, and this does not qualify under those regulations for Rule 20 or 20. We are, we're working on, that's the undergrounding project we're working on on Bay Avenue and Cap mm -hmm. Ave. So that, that is a Rule 20 project that does qualify. But unfortunately, I haven't been able to convince anybody to use our 28 money on this project. Yeah, okay. Um, well, if you have some ability to pr pursue that further with them, I would certainly encourage that. Um, also in your report, you mentioned that PG&E would need a down payment to begin work. How much? I don't have that figure yet. I think it depends yeah. what kind of how we want to proceed. Most likely in the tens of thousands of dollars, less than fifty thousand um, dollars. So if we if if we wanted to pursue undergrounding, I think it would be a probably around a thirty thousand dollar deposit um, okay. based on my Maybe other experience. Yeah. Yeah, ten to twenty percent. Yeah, and if we um, and that's just to pay for their design costs. That's yeah. that, that's what the purpose of that deposit is. If w and same thing if we pick the um, restructuring. Um, mm -hmm. would be the same thing. Okay. Uh, and one final question, Mayor. Um, um, and if we did pursue the undergrounding, would that cost come out of the contingency balance? That and any possible, quote, awards we get from the errors and omissions from the... Understood. Project. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I will say that on the errors and omissions, it would most likely cover resolving the problem in the cheapest way a less expensive way. So if we went, right. which may be the alley arm, so mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean we couldn't pursue and add our additional contingency funding um, if we wanted to go underground. Right, understood. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so if this means that we're, we can expect delays as of August and it's going to take six months, does that mean six months on to the anticipated opening of in June? 
So if, it, if we're anticipating it to open in June in 2020, but we're expecting delays as of August of 2019, are we adding that six months to the, when, when if, does that, where If does we that have to up? shut down work, we'd shut down work in August, so that's two months from now. So it'd be potential a four month delay if everything was worst case. You know, they have to shut down until we get the end of running. We are very hopeful and PG has indicated that they'll find a way to help us work through the 10 foot conflict while they're designing and working on the other projects. But so at this point, yes. So we hope not, but there's a potential that it'll push our opening date to October. It could be. Of 2020, okay. And then, um, so the, the actual cost of whatever we decide to do here comes out of the contingency uh, fund, but it was mentioned that there's also costs to the, what, contractor um, for uh, any delays that aren't of their own Right. Doing, does yeah. that also come out of the contingency fund? Yes, it would. Okay, um, so that might have been it. Yeah, that was it, those are my questions, thank you. I just have a couple. Um, what What's the timeline on figuring out how much we would potentially get through the errors and? I, I don't have a firm answer on that. I mean, we've, we've opened those discussions. Um, we hope to continue and try and resolve them in the next maybe couple weeks. Mm -hmm. um, what that final amount will be will is obviously depend on what the final costs are and, and things like that. It couldn't be reversed so that we would have an idea of how much we would possibly get so then we can make a better decision on how we're, util how we're using those dollars. Because it's like right. we're, no, I, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's tough. Um, we, we could work on that as we get when we come back, but a, a lot of it, it, we'll know more how the errors and omissions c discussions are going by the next time we meet. That's probably the best answer. I don't know if I can give you anything more firm than that at this point. It would help me make a better decision on, on which of the choices. It could be, it's $150,000 difference in the options. I understand, yes. Um, and then you mentioned pg e or a contractor for the underground option, do we have a difference in cost there? So it's a $300,000 project, would no, a contractor be cheaper or? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, it's all right. Um, we anticipate the cost would be the same, um, whether pg e does the trenching or a contractor. Mm -hmm. Contractor schedule is probably much quicker. Getting on a pg e construction schedule is, is one of the longest lead times I've ever seen. So I think that's more of a way to expedite the construction than it is a cost savings. And you had mentioned that in that it's not just PG&E lines, it's for underground, it's like AT&T. So would we have to work with additional vendors to complete the underground project or would it just be PG&E or a contractor? So for the construction, it would be one person would, would construct the conduits, whether it's PG&E or uh, the contract, they would install the conduits for AT&T and for the cable okay. company. Okay. Cable companies or the other utilities then come in and actually pull their wires, but the construction would be done by a single I'm contractor. just trying to imagine any unforeseen costs, right, like right. AT&T comes out and says, oh, that's another 50,000 for us to come and plug things There will be AT&T costs that I've tried to estimate in here. I mean, they're gonna have you did. costs, yes. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, and then lastly, on and in terms of both options, have we thought about the impact on traffic? So six months of work being done, have we thought about what that would look like and um, what that I don't would think it's six in? months of work. It's six months includes their design time okay. and all that's probably- Would streets be closed? No, no, they'll be able to- Drive because through. Because the, the trench is gonna actually go behind the existing curb if we went underground. Um, and or if they're r working on the poles, they'll be able to work in the bike lane. I think they'll be able to certainly keep uh, two lanes of traffic or flag traffic through there. It, you know, there'll be some impacts, but I don't think they'll have to close the road. Okay, and I just, I definitely would just um, add or agree with, with council member's story about looking at other options if pg and &E, I know you mentioned their program or Monterey Community Power as a partner. Um, any other things that may be out there that we haven't thought about. Um, but for me, it's, it's a challenge to think about making a choice when we don't know how much money we have to play with, <laughs> per no, se. I understand that. 
Yeah, I just have a quick question. On, on the um, this sheet, the handout that we got, the contingency was 954000 You're showing $200,000. This is pending of corrections. You kind of touched on it. That was some dirt removal costs and... No, uh, that $200,000 is budget changes we've made uh, uh, mainly into the architectural engineering fees. Um, we've had those have increased as we've gone through time. Um, they may oh, that's that's the part where the right. original engineering fees are one two nine five, and they're now one one exactly. million five. Yeah. Okay. So it it's it's a very fluid kind of budget at this point, um, but the overall the contingencies have gone down by two hundred because we you know we reduced the FF and E budget at the same time and. Okay, so the remaining balance is seven fifty three, but but there's pending here for two hundred, which means it's going to reduce it down to five fifty three. Is that how I'm reading that? Yeah, and there's also a, a six hundred nineteen thousand dollar of the budget just remaining that's outside of contingency. So that's a, a remaining fund balance. So one way or the other, there's one point three million kind of unspoken for at this right. point. Right. I'm I'm just I'm focusing right. on the contingency because that's yes. how we started, yes. and that seven fifty three is due with the. That's the dirt removal, and is it the rain delays that are adding, yeah. adding to that? Actually, the rain delays don't have a cost associated with them. Okay, but other yes, costs are going right. to knock that from 753. The, the, the dirty dirt and all that is that 199,640 that we're Which will take us down to 553. Yes. Okay. That was my question. Thanks for clarifying. That's all I have. Um, when I did the walkthrough, you had an issue about uh, location and transformers. What's the status of that? So that's will be resolved once we make a, uh, a choice of choice of how we're going to um, move it right now pg and es they've they've been given us some sketches on on alternatives where it's going to be it's mainly s most likely still going to be on the wharf road side uh, that's where pg and e okay. really that's wants the original it to be. site yeah okay um, if it goes private are we going to have to do an rfq and then have that time time lag no it would be existing consultants on the job for design there you know, on the job okay, and so the contractor is already on the job too yeah okay thanks any other questions no okay um do we just need to accept the report public no i'm awfully sorry anyone in the public would like to ask a question makes your grade go higher <laughs> Okay. Any students have any recommendations for us? You're definitely yeah. a political <laughs> science. Okay. Uh, uh, come to the dais if you have a question. Yeah. You rose your hand. You raised your hand. Yeah, come on up. Oh, okay. <laughs> what would you say? Oh, that's okay. Well. So do we need to take action on this? Yes. Accept the report. I'm waiting. <laughs> I mean, I think to the extent that we can get direction about which option, because I think fundamentally at the end of the day, <coughs> there's really two paths forward. We either go down the underground path and understand that it's probably a bit more expensive, but at the end of the day, there's value because we have a better product, or we try to resolve this at the lowest common, lowest common price. And I mean, I think to the extent that we're focused, I think it will help expedite this and avoid potential future delays. Um, so hearing where the council is at, it doesn't mean that this is a firm commitment and we can't change courses down the road, but really getting everybody focused and kind of rowing in one direction would help at this stage. Well, I have one question, Sam. So in that we're going to get some money from the uh, contractor or someone, the Arizona Emissions Act. So that, that's going to be down the line, okay? So we have to cover the cost right now, whatever it is, correct? No, what I'm that sorry. would be is, is the architects and engineers we, we've hired have errors and omissions insurance, and so whether this is an error and omission that would trigger their insurance coverage, and, and you, we, we may ultimately have a closed session item, item on that okay. in the future. Okay, so we don't know. Okay, so I'm sort of referring to that issue here is that if we're going to get some money out of that, I don't know how certain that is, that helps us in making our decision. So if we do get some money, we might go one way because it's going to help us cover that option like the and undergrounding. And whether we can give you that answer before we really need to make a decision, I, you I cannot. can't promise you. You cannot. Okay. So at this point, it's what we think would be the best. Ed. Thank you. Um, I'm I'm 
I'm livid with what where we are right now with this. Okay, I, I, I've got on here a, a architect that, that raised this price from one two nine five to one five, and as far as I'm concerned, by the drawing, it's clear in the drawing that the building is near the wires, and the, and the previous OSHA laws and safety laws existed. So this is definitely an error on the architect. So whatever we need to do, however we need to proceed, whether that's legally, whatever. I think this council needs to reinstate to the architect that this is an error on their part. Um, with that being said, that's going to play out as it is. The next most important thing is I don't want to delay the progress of the library one bit. Uh, so, and what what it, what the situation we have here is is had we have known that this was the situation, and had we have possibly done what was suggested, at least by this council member here, reduce the size of this building so that it was in probably three feet to get out of that window, we would have saved probably a million dollars on the building and we would not be in this predicament right now with the existing wires. But that is what we call water under the bridge at this point. So the solution that I'm, that I'm looking at here is, is that I'm seeing this as a $150,000 repair to move the wires or a $300,000 repair to underground the wires. I doubt that we're going to get them done for either one of those numbers. Okay, my my guess is it's probably going to be a four hundred thousand dollar repair to underground and a, or two hundred thousand dollar repair to do the wiring. I don't hold the architect responsible for the four hundred thousand dollar fee because they should only be responsible for what the minimum number is to re resolve the problem, which in my mind is the one hundred fifty to two hundred thousand dollar for the sake of conversation one hundred fifty thousand dollar argument. I think that we have a, a situation here where if we don't underground this, we would look at this as we are going to build a $14 million, $13 million building and have these ugly wires adorning it. So it's not an issue at this point as to whether we should underground or not. Uh, I hate to take this money because all this money that I see that's either saved or in the contingency is money that comes out of our general fund, which is other projects that could be done in this city. but. If this project, if the building was smaller and the wires were here, we would live with those wires. But to not underground at this point would be a huge mistake. So uh, my uh, recommendation and the motion I'm going to make is that we pursue the uh, the uh, errors and omissions to the maximum extent, and we move forward with PG&E and get in a co contract to underground the facilities as soon as possible. I'll second that motion. I move. Comment. Yeah. Uh, thank you. It's unfortunate that this is an um, kind of after fact and just coming up now. Um, and I, to me, this, the undergrounding of the wires should have been made part of the original project. Um, when there's any other development in our community uh, by property owners, we require them to underground their utilities. Um, and I think that should have been thought of here. With that said, I think this is an opportunity to further beautify Capitola. Um, and I mean, over the many years, whenever I drive around, I'm always looking at those telephone poles and those telephone wires and just wishing, oh God, I wish those weren't there because uh, they're pretty ugly. Um, and so I think this is an opportunity to um, make a good project better. Um, we will be able to offset the expense of it to some extent, um, and I think that we should diligently pursue that. Um, and and, and it, it is a high cost, but if we're ever going to do this, this is probably the cheapest time uh, to be able to do this uh, in that area. Uh, I think it will make a for a better looking um, neighborhood there and a better project. And it also provides benefits for our park across the street, the Rispin, um, and making that a better project. So that's why I seconded the motion um, and will support it. Thank you. I, I do have one other question, Steve. So in terms of the underground going to Rispin, so I could see going to the pole and then beyond the pole it goes to the house, uh, I mean to me, uh, the Rispin mansion. Now, to me, that's a separate project, is taking them from that yep. pole to the mansion. Yeah, the actual service from the meter will be near Wharf Road, and from that meter to the building would be part of the park project. Okay. The underground okay. That, that's my concern. I didn't want this to be right. paid for out of that. Yeah. Okay, good. So, um, any more comments? Is that yeah, um, 
I, I, I'll support this motion, but I just want to just um, comment that the the pressing issue of time isn't really an issue of time when we're already pushing this project out potentially into October. That's um, with the delay. So waiting two weeks to see what the outcome of the, um, what was it called, the errors and omissions outcome, it, you know, that doesn't really go, you know, it, waiting two weeks for that outcome isn't another, isn't a big deal to me to have to wait that much time, much more time. The other thing I just want to, again, add is that this isn't all five poles going underground. This is three poles going underground, and there still would be two poles still left left there. So I just want to be clear in that in that we understand what what's really at um, what we're really agreeing to tonight. Um, one other question: uh, potentially going underground, we could move faster. I think. I mean, excuse me. We have more control over that than. We do from the construction standpoint, yes. Right. Okay. Uh, might be able to utilize our existing on underground contractor. Yeah. Okay. Great. So that's an added bonus. Um, I definitely agree. Uh, that's going to make the library a lot more desirable in terms of looking at, and to the public itself. Thanks for that guy. That was quick. Okay. There is a motion and a second, and Ed has another comment. I just want to clarify my motion. My motion is not to delay for the uh, omissions and errors at all. It, it's uh, uh, the action we take tonight is to move forward as soon as possible. That action with with the errors will play out however it does. Right. Has nothing to do with our decision. And um, with regard to the polls, can we go back to the picture with the polls? I think it is. We are taking out five, and I understand. And then the, the main thing that's going on here is, and I'm not sure if it's clear to everybody else, but there's a, com a combination of high tension wires and, and low voltage wires, and that's the reason why the poles and the transformers and the transitional poles are going to have to be added here. But I still think we're going to take out five. Is that what the plan is? So we're taking out. So this pole right here will remain. Right. This pole go, this pole go, and two poles in this direction will go, and plus one pole on the wrist one will go. Right. And we, we'll but we'll be add back in yeah, three. The transitionals to the accommodate transitionals, the transformers. Yes. I understand that. Right. But they, they'll be in closer proximity to the poles. They'll be within they 10 feet of the existing poles at the end. Right. They won't affect that appearance, right. as Absolutely. Sam had mentioned about, you know, which is the main reason why we're doing this. Yeah. So they will, yeah, they will be at the outer limits. Just of the wanted to clarify the motion. Okay, uh, see no more questions. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, passes, 5-0. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, we have a new presentation on item B. Discussion of the revised zoning code for Coastal Commission certification. Mayor and City Council, um, I'm back before you tonight with an, another update on the zoning code. Uh, tonight I'm going to just present items that came up after the original adoption in 2018 of significant items that are, are, signi are changes to the code. There are quite a few edits within that, w that we found in reviewing the code since the adoption such as in tables referencing items below it in, in other sections of the code. And I did not highlight all of those within tonight's discussion. I found those to be minor in nature. So tonight it's really those items that are a change that will change the regulations within the code and, and points of clarification. These, th the items I'm bringing you tonight have nothing to do with the Coastal Commission modifications. Mm -hmm. Those will be reviewed at the next um, actually at the June 27th meeting. So um, with that, just a quick overview, 2018, we adopted a new zoning code. Right now it is only applicable in the area outside the zoning, uh, the coastal zone, and our 1975 code continues to apply within the coastal zone. For many communities, that's not a big deal. For Capitol, it's two-thirds of our city, so that we're still working with the old code. Um, I've got six topics I'm going to run through, and I'm happy to, if, as questions come up, um, if you'd like, we can stop after each topic, and I can ask if you have questions on that topic, um, and then continue on. 
Um, so the first topic is mini bars and outdoor kitchens. Within the new code, we built in allowances within our setback regulations for outdoor kitchens. With um, we we transferred the old standards for mini bars and, co and convenience areas, and you'll see under D it says internal access to the area shall be maintained within the dwelling. Um, with the allowance of an outdoor kitchen, we need to remove D. So that was that's that change. Is there any questions regarding that? Okay. I'll move on. Second is density limits in the community commercial and co regional commercial zoning districts. This I brought to you with the general plan update. We've had quite a few discussions on um, during the general plan going back to the way it's always, um, how density has been calculated within our commercial zones, not utilizing uh, density as dwelling units per acre, but always depending on floor area ratio, height, open space, and setbacks. So with that, we're cleaning up the code to make it go back to the way it, it's always been and not having a maximum density. And is there any questions on that? Um, would the density bonuses for low-income housing increase that 20 units per acre? Um, so the density bonus for under the state density bonus law mm -hmm. would um, essentially, without having a density limit, there they most likely a developer would not try to get a density bonus in an area without a density limit. As a reminder, this is consistency with some general plan amendment stuff that we looked at earl earlier this year. Mm -hmm. So this is just revising the code to be consistent with the general plan. And you'll recall that if you have a density, then you can get a density bonus under state density bonus law. And if we take that out, um, there really isn't a situation, mm -hmm. or at least a likely situation, where a developer would be requesting any increased density. So the um, under the floor area ratio standards would not be affected by the state density bonus? Um. No, you know, um, when that question came up before, I reached out to uh, another land use attorney regarding that, and it really seemed like the incentive, the, the incentive with the density bonus is to increase the density of the zone. So once you've re effectively removed the density, there's not, but under, you know, there's the standards for affordable housing, uh, uh, there's decreased parking requirements within the um, density bonus law, so that may be one avenue in which a developer would want to utilize the density bonus to, to achieve lower parking requirements, but that's really the only item that comes to mind that would influence that. All right, thanks. You're welcome. Yeah, to Sam's point, th th are we just taking a path to circumvent the state's ability to, to have a density bonus? Yeah, I'm, I'm confused by that. Uh, n within our multifamily <laughs> zoning districts, anyone could come in, a, a developer could come in and utilize the density bonus. Um, so on Claire Street recently, there was a project in which the developer was able to get an extra unit utilizing a density bonus law. Right. And that would still hold true with any of our residential areas within Capitol. Only, only for commercial then is what we're talking about. Only for commercial. Got it. Okay. So not at the mall. There can't be an opportunity to for the developer should there be housing. So they, they could apply for a density bonus, but where we're essentially removing the density limits, the dwelling units per acre, um, it would be in so that that incentive's not really there to apply for a density bonus because they can go as dense as they'd like as long as they provide the parking, the open space, and the setbacks. If they, however, wanted to decrease their parking requirement and say bring in 35% of the project as affordable housing on top of what our affordable housing requirement is then they, they could pursue a density okay. bonus, but. And also not to beat a dead horse here, but the mall is in that uh, FAR incentive zone for 41st. So if they provided, they provide the community benefits, which can include affordable housing, they can actually move up to a higher FAR, not state bonus density law, it's our own yeah. internal zoning. Okay, any other questions? Do we accept that? 
Okay, next is the vacation rental overlay and enforcement. This is an area where um, under our old code, the we used to call it the transient rental overlay. There was the, the regular, um, actually all the standards that made it into our new code and then our enforcement was under a special regulation section of the code and it didn't carry over. Um, so it was just because it was divided in the old code and when we transferred it into the new code that wasn't caught but it was in a, second, a separate area of the old code. So it's actually a really important piece of this code. Um, just it's for us to follow up on vacation rentals. This is very strong language for us to go after um, not only the property owner but if there's a real estate representative says uh, any person including but not limited to property owners, property managers or real estate agents may do so in the following manner as long as they have a vacation rental permit. So otherwise, if they don't have a vacation rental permit, we've got the ability to enforce. So any questions with this one? Um, just to be clear, this was not brought to the Planning Commission. Our Correct. Planning commission. So this item, as well as the kitchens, um, the outdoor kitchen, items were not brought to the Planning Commission. When you do have a substantial change that after the Planning Commission has made a recommendation and it has come to City Council, we will need to bring these items back to the Planning Commission because they have not reviewed them yet. So at the end of my presentation, I'll go over that in a little more detail. Thank you, Chad. Um, this is kind of related and kind of not, but uh, if, if it's appropriate for me to ask at this time, can someone tell me when we're doing our next audit of the vacation rentals that are currently allowed and not? We'll have to cover this pretty briefly. Yes, yes, yep. Mary. Thank you. Good, good evening, Mary Council. Yes, right now I'm actually working with HVL, the consultant that we just brought on board recently and kind of developing the plan. So hopefully within the next 30 days, the program gets kicked off. Perfect, thank you. Sure. Um, we're, we're going, uh, I should mention this, uh, we're going through this item by item. And um, if anyone in the public would like to speak on a particular item, please do come forward. Otherwise, I'm just gonna be asking people on the city council if they're all in agreement because we're just trying to go through each one. But believe me, anyone in the public here would like to speak including a particular city planning member, you're definitely able to speak. Thank you very much. Let's Thank continue. you. Maybe we'll get an interested intern out of this process yes. as well. Yes, interns <laughs> involved too, <laughs> believe me. Um, so next is a topic for the garage floor area exception. So the Planning Commission did review this. Um, under the new code there, actually during our way back before the code was adopted during issues and options, the a member of the city council asked us to build in a garage floor area exception for um, smaller lots. So once you're, if you're on a small lot in Capitola, once you hit a certain size lot, you're required to provide covered parking. So that was requested and we put in for all lots under 3,000 square feet a 250 square foot exception for a garage that wouldn't count towards your floor area to incentivize covered parking. We had a gentleman from the public who's developing his home and he came in and said, what about the homes in this area where there's this gap after 3,000 feet, uh, 3,000 square foot lots that lose out on this additional FAR? Um, how can we make this fair? So I brought this to the Planning Commission and after reviewing what the member of the public was proposing, the Planning Commission, the blue line is the original line that I showed you and the Planning Commission asked us to go back, f figure out why this exception was in there, and like I said, it was because it was a request for uh, uh, exception on small lots. And they, so we identified exactly what size lot in which you could achieve uh, not having covered parking. So that's a 2,580 square, 87 square foot lot. This gets pretty technical, it's a lot of math. <laughs> And, but essentially what we did is carried the green line across to make it fair. We got rid of the unfair zone that was shown in the previous slide. Um, so there's a new section that states exactly when you're allowed to have the, get the 250 square foot exception and that's for any lot under 2,500 
and 86 square feet. And then we also put in a new math equation for to cover those people that are in that in between. I have an example there of a 3,000 square foot lot and they would achieve a 40 square foot garage exception. And with that, I'll this <coughs> there's a second part to this, but for the first part, does anyone have any questions? I think someone passed their algebra. Okay. Great algebra. Yes, <laughs> it was great. <laughs> okay. Next, there were a lot of discussions about how can we get people to utilize their garage more, um, and garages become areas for putting all our toys. So um, within the garage, we, we typically, under the today's code, we look at the square footage of a home and we decide how much parking you're required based on the floor area of the home. We don't subtract the area required for parking that's covered. So. We built in two exceptions. One was for the area that's counted for parking no longer counts towards your parking calculation. And then the Planning Commission during this last um, update included up to a 125 square feet for ancillary space so people can put um, a kayak, a couple bikes <coughs> in, in their garage and it's not gonna count towards their parking requirement. So those are the two changes regarding parking. Okay, we in agreement, okay. Okay, so next, th these are major changes. This came down from the state um, on accessory dwelling units. And within the state regulations, you're required to have an administrative review process for secondary dwelling units. Um, and we've had that, but within the new code we built in, we'd, we'd state what the uh, um, administrative process was and then had a lot of However, if you want to deviate for extra height or decreased setbacks, we had the processes built in. We've now separated, we've moved, moved the deviations to any of the standards to the end of the chapter. And so it's a, what's, what's up front in the chapter is an administrative process and then at the very end are the deviations which require a conditional use permit and design permit by the Planning Commission. Um, the new code treats ADUs three different ways. There's internal ADUs, which are either within the existing home or an existing accessory structure. Attached ADUs, which are attached to the exterior of the structure, or a detached ADU, which is detached from the, the um, single family home. In a future slide, I'll be showing you the changes to parking. The only, par the only um, ADU situation in which you're required to provide parking anymore is for a new detached ADU, so that would be under three. But there are now parking exceptions for internal ADUs and detached ADUs. I have a question. Um, sure. The existing accessory uh, structure, could that be an ADU in a garage? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, new, so one of the largest changes also is that within the single family zoning district, any single family home is allowed to have an ADU as long as it um, passes on fire requirements. So we had to remove our minimum lot size within the R1 district for ADUs. So there's no longer a minimum lot size in the R1. There are within the RM and, and mixed use neighborhood zones. Um, Anyone agree? Any questions there? And that's only for internal ADUs, so only the ADUs that are within a home that are allowed. And then for parking requirements, the uh, many more exceptions were placed in if you're within a half a mile of public transit, if you're located within a national historic district or other like a city historic district. And number three is the big one, one part of the proposed or existing primary residence or accessory structure. So if you're within the existing building or it's an addition and part of the existing building, you're not required to provide parking um, for the ADU. So again, it's only those detached new accessory dwelling units that don't meet any of the other criteria in this slide. So and there's parking permit requirements um, if they're not offered to you or a car share that's close by. So they're really promoting ADUs and making it easier. This, this is really interesting. Um, currently, that's a single family home in the garage. Under the new standard, um, a garage or a carport can be transformed into an ADU. And um, you can 
make your garage an ADU, you're parking, the only parking requirement, you're not required to park um, the new ADU, but only park for the, s the square footage of the existing single family home. And the language I underlined, in any configuration on the same lot as the accessory unit, including but not limited to covered space, uncovered, tandem, or by the use of mechanical automobile parking lifts. So that really is, it's going in a whole new direction of just giving allowances of wherever you'd like to place parking on your lot. Um, and that's really it. It's their major changes though. There's a, a lot of opportunities for more ADUs in Capitola now. This is mostly state mandated. This is state mandated. And if someone came to the counter today, I would have to issue permits under these regulations, whether or not they've been uh, adopted. So, any questions? Oh, one last time, any questions for the public? Okay, I think we've approved or and then given to every single one as we one, one last one, uh, single room occupancy. There was a definition that was in our old parking section of the code and it have now moved it into the definitions. It wasn't in our parking section and it wasn't in our definition. So it's a dwelling unit with a kitchen facility which is 400 square feet or less. So just adding that. And I'm gonna, um, at this point, I don't wanna bring any new items to the city council unless they're, you know, when the item came up with the vacation rentals, that's a really important item that impacts us on a regular basis, especially in the summer. So I thought it was essential for these last items that came up to bring, to include. But at this point, I can guarantee you that I'm gonna try my hardest not to add to the list. And if um, hopefully any minor items will just tally off, because once we have this, adopted i'm expecting to do annual updates of cleanup items because of the whole new zoning code i expect that to be part of the growing process so um, next steps city council review so july 25th the city attorney overview of the coastal commission edits after that we'll continue to whichever date certain you'd like um, i was thinking it Following that, any items that the city council would like to discuss, if you can provide me with those ahead of time, we can okay. have it an agenda set for um, just the items that you'd like to discuss further and learn more about that are in the code. And then we can continue to have meetings based on what, you're, what you'd like information on. Once we do have all of your comments and direction, we will publish an updated draft based on all the direction you've provided. I'll take it back to Planning Commission for a recommendation, and then it'll come back to City Council for adoption. After that, we'll submit to the Coastal Commission. Any more questions <laughs> for Cindy? I, I do. Oh, sure. um, just to be clear, if we have a suggestion on an, uh, on an area that you may not be talking about reviewing, like the community benefits, is that the section? Yeah. If there was an addition there, is there an opportunity, or when is the opportunity to bring that up? When would that be? I mean, right now would be an opportunity, or you're okay. welcome to email me a list of items you'd like placed on an agenda. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so I, I would love to look at the offer, um, if there's an option to add to the list of uh, community benefits, child care centers, in the language, there's like affordable housing, next, you know, all of those, mm -hmm. um, if we could add that to the list or how we could do that. Okay, I'll bring that up at a future meeting. Thank you. Okay. Good meeting. Sam? Just uh, a clarification about the schedule. Um, on the staff written staff report, it says the next steps at our June 27th meeting will be reviewing the Coastal Commission red line. But I assume that's still on um, the calendar. I'm so sorry. Then uh, that we're not. I, I I'm sorry. You're absolutely right. So June 27th and July 25th. Sorry, that was an error. So j the next meeting is that we'll be refu reviewing um, the city attorney feedback is June 27th. That was the question. I'll be June 27th, and then I think the August date there will be July. So that was just a mistake. Right. So what's in the written staff report are the accurate next steps. Yes. And we'll ignore that unless we have the option of continuing it to maybe August 22nd. 
so that's the contingency. Okay, thank you, Flair. Sorry, thank you. Okay, with that, meeting adjourned. Thank you. <laughs> you think he's going to go with you?